Hi, I'm Kyle, and this video is brought to you by the Old Road Zine. Today, we are going to figure out how to get from here to here. The first step is to print out an isometric grid on some cardstock. There are plenty of places to download isometric templates, so just, um, just a quick Google search will really get you what you need. I like to print mine out with very light cyan blue lines because um, that makes it easier to remove in the digital process afterwards. But before we can contend with our grid paper, we must first conquer the sketch page. This is the most intimidating part of the whole process, is just looking at a blank sheet of paper and not really knowing what's going to go on it. So there's um, a couple of things that we can do to help us get through this process, but oftentimes you'll sit down, you'll want to, to draw something, but you won't know what to draw. And uh, that is exactly where I have found myself today. So um, we'll see if I can dig my way out of it. Our first strategy against this foe is the humble sketchbook. Now, if you are as intimidated by blank paper that I am, uh, you can buy all the moleskin, beautiful leather-bound sketchbooks in the world, and they'll just sit on your shelf and you'll never use them which is why I like to hand make my sketchbook. And as you go through, you can kind of see just me playing around with uh, all these different ideas and uh, any words that pop into my head, any images, any concepts, they all live here. I really owe the, the, this breakthrough of using a handmade sketchbook to overcome that first step, that fear of this pristine white paper, uh, to my good friend, Sean, who gave me this. And it absolutely transformed my uh, artistic practice. So it came with a couple of advantages. First of all, it has this wonderful illustration on the front of it, and it's just kind of made out of chipboard and stapled together. There is this wonderful gift in here, though. If I don't know if you can see it, but the first couple of pages, it seems that Sean had used this first couple of pages and then just tore them out and uh, gave this sketchbook to me when I, I think I bought a commission from him or something. Um, and then on the back, it has this little post-it note that just says, turn undead. And I just left that there. I, I thought that's so beautiful. And for the first time in my life, I was able to just fill this sketchbook with ideas and drawings and words and studies. Um, I didn't use all of it because uh, I really just wanted to make one of my own, but I got through most of it and I'm very proud of it. So the second sketchbook that I made, I uh, made this one right here. Um, this is again, uh, one of uh, Sean's uh, images that I just kind of glued to the front here. And uh, yeah, I used my own, um, I used my own grid paper for this. And it, again, just, it was so easy just to carry this around in my pocket and have it for whenever I needed to take, take notes. I've made a few more of these. Um, and uh, I think this one was the first hand stitched one that I made and it's holding together pretty nicely. Yeah, sketchbooks, make them. Something else that I have been doing for things that don't fit in sketchbooks, things that are on like loose leaf pieces of paper, I just put them in this uh, old um, nut jar. Let's take a look, see, Let, let's see what we have. Uh, this is the map of the spheres that I was working on. What are some other things in here? This is the sheet that I was using to test out different uh, inks on for the secret map. So this was accomplished just by diluting some highlighter ink. What else do we have? I'll probably get to it later. Uh, let's see, some notes. Uh, what is this? Luckily, we have I, I have solved this problem for myself already. 
take a look at this. Okay, so this is our big regional map. When I'm thinking about what what to work on next. I don't have to come up with a brand new idea because I already have uh, so many of these evocative ideas just right here, right before me on this page. For now, I think I want to zoom in on this uh, Soul Cypress Valley and see if I can't pull some kind of like ghost forest idea out of that. <laughs> I have folded this paper because I want uh, I want to remind myself not to draw any important details too close to this fold right here because that's where uh, we're going to lose important details between the pages. To start off, it's always a good idea just to kind of rough in our grid just to remind us that we are going to be working isometrically. This doesn't need to be perfect. It doesn't need to be measured. This just needs to kind of keep us from accidentally slipping out of the perspective. We've solved a lot of our initial problem of staring at this blank page, right? We've already ruined it, so it's no longer blank. But the ideas just, they aren't coming out right now. So how do we solve this problem? My, my second favorite tool is just making a list. Write down a couple of things that sound like they would fit well in this map. That will probably get me started. There's plenty of things to draw. Now we just need to figure out where to put it. The best thing to do at this point, break down the composition into components and think about which ones are going to take up the most room, uh, which ones need to be considered first for the overall composition. And I think this river right here is going to be where we start. So something like that, um, if we have a river, uh, maybe we have a bridge, uh, maybe that bridge is uh, broken. And I'm not trying to make any of this pretty, I'm just trying to balance out this composition and make things clear and evocative. So if we have a river going through here and a bridge crossing it right here, uh, that bridge must connect to a path. So rivers are also at the bottoms of hills. As a result, we know that we could probably put some kind of hill or something on the opposite side of this. Putting taller items over here uh, will do well. So maybe we'll put even some of these big old cypress trees uh, kind of leading into this path right here. And then maybe some uh, creepy doors. When in doubt, creepy doors. I like the idea of there are these like creepy zombie hands that are kind of always uh, grasping around. I can imagine if you were a DM, you could make all sorts of creepy voices to whatever is inside of these. <coughs> oh, stay hydrated, folks. Probably we'll have these cypress trees kind of like whipping around in the wind a little bit, add a little bit of movement into it. Do you have the freedom, if not the mandate, to draw poorly at this stage in the process? What we could do is have like a fallen tree that blocks the path. So you're warned before you go into the forest uh, that you aren't, uh, you, you are not by any means to leave the marked path. That is no longer an option to you. And, and then you have to kind of go one way. It's the same thing in both directions. So I need to think of something else to put over here. I think we'll put some mushrooms over here. Now, because we are isometric, we want to put our shorter mushrooms down here in front. Something that draws you in, something that really uh, uh, makes this place seem mysterious and purposeful, but also vague and evocative, as Dale Kingsmill would say. I think what we'll do with this dolmen is have kind of like this black fog. 
we'll put our ferry station over here. Uh, this this will be good. We'll have some like torches or something around here to kind of let people know there's a ferry station. But again, you would have to leave the road to get to it. So we need to put some kind of uh, other, other obstacle. Uh, but these will-o'-the-wisps are going to be um, kind of like coming in and out and kind of swerving. I want, I think I want to put some kind of like lamp rays in, in, in the water. What, what does that mean? What's he up to? I'm kind of thinking what I want to do is put like a Sleeping Beauty Snow White uh, kind of coffin right here, uh, like a glass coffin. Um, but I don't actually think that that goes well with every th all the other theming that we have going on here. But I am going to write that down in my notebook for later. A prayer labyrinth. Uh, so I think I'm going to put in one of those... And I think we're just ready to go for um, for uh, the blue pencil on the actual grid paper. I think this is a really excellent start. We are going to start in much the same way we started our rough pencils. I have my rough pencils up here off screen um, uh, for uh, easy reference. Uh, but uh, our angles are going to be a little bit different. Things, the scale is going to be a little bit different now that we actually have a grid in front of us. Um, but I'm going to do all of this step basically with this, this, and this. Before I forget, I am going to measure where the seam in the middle is going to go. That seems like a reasonably wide river to me. Uh, I want my bridge to kind of go up like this. So I figured because I'm basically drawing everything three times in a row uh, that uh, I, I didn't really need to explain the blue penciling. I do want to bring your attention to a few changes we made uh, from the rough pencils to the blue pencil stage. Now that we have an actual grid in front of us, um, that scale is going to become very specific. I did swap the places of the barrows and kind of uh, where this uh, sacred beast is going to be hanging out. I also decided uh, to leave this harp out of the middle of these of this mushroom ring. So let's start inking. I ink uh, all in Micron uh, 05. Um, so I, I don't really switch between this all that much. If I have to fill in, um, I'll use this brush pen uh, right here. I talked a lot of, at the beginning about how, imp how important it is to just be messy and get stuff down this phase. It's important to take care and, um, and move from top left to bottom right if you can. Uh, I'm right-handed, so I don't want to smear over anything. Uh, if you don't really know where these lines are going, if you just kind of uh, make an indistinct kind of meandery dotty line and then fill it in with hatching, it'll look like you knew what you were doing all along. To really achieve that sense of overlapping and depth, um, there's this technique called haloing, which is where you just leave an empty trough of white paper in between things that are overlapping. So generally, whatever is in front is the thing that gets completely drawn, and then whatever is behind is the thing that gets abbreviated. I like to do uh, contour at the same time that I'm doing cross-hatching, but it really uh, shortens the amount of time that you have to spend at your drawing table. It's very easy to get discouraged and stressed out and, and anxious when you are inking a page and there's no undo button. Um, but don't be intimidated. Just keep pushing through. And uh, if you are notice that you keep overworking something because you're not happy with it, step away from it a little bit and probably just solve it by uh, blacking it out and really making sure that those values are clear. 
we have implied that the lighting is kind of heading from the northwest. Uh, and, and so we have these deep shadows on the sides of these trees and this dolmen that are facing us. So we just need to make sure that we keep that consistent as we are shading the tree trunks and, um, well, you know, uh, everything else in this image. It is important not only to move from the top left to the bottom right as we go to prevent smudging, but it's also important to keep in mind that we need to, uh, as we ink, move from foreground to background. So you might look at this and see that I um, will oftentimes in incorporate the grid into this map. Even though it's not a tactical map, I still like to put in the grid because it, it, it brings out the mappiness of the map. It lets people know kind of where the ground is. I, I've said what I need to. I, I can stop talking about this now. There's always this magical moment that happens during a piece it's coming together and you've crossed the halfway point and it's just, you just get in the zone after that. And um, oh boy, I just love that part. I don't know. I get the feeling that people never get to that part sometimes, like ever. <laughs> yeah, that bums me out. My back was telling me that it was time to call it a night. So I arise first thing to get back to it. I decided to add thorns amongst uh, the cypress trees to the exit here um, because I felt like a fallen tree, you could just say, well, I chop it up or I hop over it. It wasn't enough of an obstacle and it wasn't exciting. Now I've made my first real smudge, my first real accident of the, uh, of the drawing. Um, so pretty good overall, but uh, this one is going to be a problem. So because it's crossing over this kind of uh, torch that was going to be at this ferry station, probably what I will do is just see if I can blend it into the boat with some clever hatching. One of the big reasons I left the ferryman in here, um, I often don't like to draw characters in here, um, but I think the ferryman, he has sort of like an eternal supernatural quality to him. And it also adds this idea of verbs um, into the map, but not verbs so much for the player, but verbs for the GM. I think that's one of the big differences between tabletop RPGs and video games. You need verbs both for the person who's running the game and kind of generating the fictional scenarios, and you need verbs for uh, the players who are interacting with that. So we, we need to equip both sides of the table, so to speak, with things to do, things to draw from, activities to um, engage in. So as I was drawing, I wrote down this note in my notebook about Snow White's coffin. And uh, it, as I was drawing, as I was thinking about things, I kept thinking about like, what, how could we make this strange? It kind of made me think about something else to put on my big old map here. This is why it's important to have notebooks and sketches and, and working rough drafts out and available. I want to do this big earthworm. Earthworms are of the, uh, I think it's phylum or, or subspecies of lumbricid. I'm just going to put that on my map, and I think that might be one of the next maps that we do. Is just like this great big snoring earthworm. A big part of my creative process is funno aesthetics. Uh, things that sound fun to say, like Soul Cypress Valley, is something that is is fun. Saying Soul Cypress, it's so juicy. Um, and slumbering lumberkid is uh, is another one of those. It has a a a meter and a poetry to it um, that I feel like it or it it agitates creativity within me. So I wanted to write that down. So I think this is done. I, I, I think I have what I want out of this map. I'm just gonna go through, take one final pass, see if there's any line weights that need to be beefed up or um, values that need to be adjusted here and there. Um, but uh, I think I'm uh, maybe five, 10 minutes away from being finished with this.
wouldn't you know it? And five minutes on the dot, basically. Uh, boy, uh, you know, that's what happens when you draw for a few decades. You sort of get a sense for these things. Or maybe I'm just calling it quits. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's about it for this map. So, if you found something I said useful or nifty, leave a like. And if you have any questions for me, I will answer them down in the comments. And maybe one day we'll meet on the old roads. Mm -hmm.